UBC understands the power that language has to either limit or broaden our understanding and experience of God. While we do not change every reading or hymn in our service, we do try to balance cultural and gender references to include all persons in the worship of God. Please feel free to use inclusive language during worship. Hello, I'm Linda Brazil, and I'm just so glad you're worshiping with us today. This is one of the best things that you can do for yourself is just take a moment and slow down. There's so much going on right now. Spring has sprung and it's crazy. I just attended a graduation for a friend of our church who finished law school. Graduation's an exciting time. It's going on all over the place. And I just wanna, just wanna wish all the graduates good luck. <laughs> Dream the big dreams just like I did. And maybe, maybe it'll come true. Thank you for all that you've done in our church, graduates, students. As the semester closes, just know that you were valued by us for all the gifts that the Lord has given you. Right now, I'd like to take a moment and pray with you and celebrate who you are. For all the students, for their teachers, for their families, for those who have worked so hard this semester, and also for those who could have worked harder, Lord, hear our prayers. For the opportunities to serve or be served. For the organizations that we support that extend our hands and our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are hurting and need comfort. For those who are sick and need healing. For those struggling who need strength. Lord, hear our prayer. Regardless of what you are dealing with right now, whether you are celebrating or grieving, soaring or struggling, your University Baptist family wants to be there for you. Please know that you are loved and let us help you. And if we need it, you could give us a hand too. For the time to regroup at the end of a semester and to focus on the days to come. Thank you, Lord, for walking with us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, please stand and join me in our call to worship printed in the bulletin. I'll read the italicized print and you respond with the bold. Great Spirit of God, you have healed our wounds. You have brought us from paths of hurt and anger. You have blessed our life that we may be a blessing to others. Let us worship you in great joy. Let us remember the ways you have turned our mourning into dancing. Let us give thanks to you forever. Please pray with me. God of power and might, let your love shine on us and through us to others. Take the blindness from our eyes and our hearts. Give us the joy of knowing and serving you in all that we say, think, and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Montgomery, I'm the pastor's wife. <laughs> and I haven't been around in a few weeks, as I was pointed out that I might be called a prospect at this moment. <laughs> anyway, I am here again, so good to see everybody. I am reading from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, then skipping down to verses 17 through 20. I am reading from the New Living Translation. As I read from this Holy Scripture, listen for God's word for you. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. As I skip down a few verses, God calls to a believer in Damascus named Ananias and tells Ananias to go to Saul and lay hands on him. Then we pick up with verse 17. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. This is the word of God for all the people of God. Thank you, God. About 20 years ago, 
at a music festival in Memphis, Tennessee, I met my friend Brian. Now Brian and I, Brian and I bonded immediately over music and of course Monty Python. <laughs> Brian once met Python's own Michael Palin and Michael Palin signed Brian's DVD copy of Life of Brian by saying to Brian, have a good life. So as you can imagine, Brian is one of my heroes. Brian is a walking, talking encyclopedia of popular culture. Every genre of music, a lover of great cinema, and a seeker after deep, honest faith. Brian also happens to be blind. Blind since he was born. And believe me, it is a wonderfully surreal experience, dare I say eye-opening experience, when you're riding across a music festival field on a golf cart and a blind man turns to you and asks if you've ever seen the legendary counterculture movie Alice's Restaurant and then begins to talk in depth about it. I may have a physical form of vision that Brian doesn't have, but Brian has a deeper vision I've learned over these 20-something years that most of us don't. Brian may be physically blind, but trust me, friends, Brian can see. In a passage from Acts that Jency just read for us, we learn of Saul's dramatic conversion on his road on a trip to Damascus. Saul had his vision miraculously taken from him. As the song goes, he was blinded by the light. And then three days later, three days later, let those of you who have ears hear, three days later it was miraculously restored. Saul, almost but not quite overnight, changed from being a relentless, vicious persecutor of Jesus' people to a leader of the Jesus' people who began to spread the good news of Christ into as much of the known world as possible at that time. Now I say Jesus' people rather than Christians because Saul was not persecuting Christians. Christians, as we like to call ourselves, did not yet exist. The Jesus people Saul was going after were Jews, like him, except not as dogmatic and doctrinally correct as Saul was, but all of them were Jews. They were Jews who still lived as Jews. They still worshipped as Jews. They still adhered to the rituals and traditions and teachings of Judaism, and they were a small but growing group within Judaism who said that Jesus taught a different way to live within Judaism. Jesus was a Jewish teacher. After all, they believed Jesus was the Messiah for the Jews, come to earth, crucified as a Jewish threat to the Roman Empire, and then rose again and had ascended into heaven. The name Christian doesn't come into being until a few chapters later in the book of Acts, where a group of non-Jews, Gentiles in Jewish terms, in a town called Antioch, they began following in the way of Jesus, but they did not first convert to Judaism to do it. It is them, they are the ones who were first described as little Christs, which is what the Greek word Christianos means. But that's a whole other story for a whole other time. Saul is hunting, hunting fellow Jews who had, shall we say, gone rogue. Saul sees himself as being called by God to be a mighty warrior for God, a soldier in the army of the Lord, a defender of the faith, and he would go fight dangerous heresies like one, like those who were professing Jesus to be Lord until he helped wipe them out of existence. 
And he was going there to round up Jewish believers, bust them back to Jerusalem, and then lock them up, or even stone them to death. I think having servers pass out ashtrays at a bar is a wonderful way to do church, don't you? <laughs> Saul, Saul would not have approved of this. <laughs> Which leads us to the next point. There's so much to the story than Saul simply hating Jesus, than meeting in a mystical encounter with Jesus, and becoming Paul, who, that Jesus so loved, that Paul so loved Jesus. So Saul, which is his Jewish name, by the way, that's all Saul is. We begin to later call him by his non-Jewish name, which is Paul when he begins to spread the news among the non-Jews later. But Saul, before his conversion, was already deeply blind in a certain sense, wasn't he? He was unable to see. Saul was unable to see God beyond his own dogma, beyond his own tradition. Saul was unable to see God beyond himself. Oh, he had his physical vision intact until he had that vision on the road to Damascus. But he was unable to see God at work beyond his understanding. He was blind to the broadness, the bigness of God and the actual ways of God in the world. We all know about the passionate fervor and feverish intensity of Saul because, still today, we have many Sauls running around us. Preachers and teachers, legislators and politicians, blinded by their fierce loyalty to tradition, the way things have always been and the way things always should be. Sauls, blinded by their power. Or even if they don't have power, blinded by their comfort in the familiar things as they are. Saul's all around us, standing up boldly for God. Saul's who come out to call out heretics and false teachers who are leading people astray. Saul's who see themselves as God's mighty warriors, soldiers in the army of the Lord, defenders of the true faith, and going after anything going after any idea, going after anyone who is perceived as a direct threat to their faith, to their tradition, to their way of life, to their God. Friends, with the religious fervor and feverish intensity that some are today attacking books, attacking ideas, attacking Wokeness, immigrants, women, people of color, Muslims, Jews, Catholics, and any in the LGBTQIA plus community. That's how Saul was going after those Jewish believers who followed Jesus as the way. That is why Saul was going to Damascus. And then he has his conversion experience, and three days later, after those things like scales fail, fr fell from his eyes, we learn through the rest of Paul, Saul, slash then Paul's life, that even then, with his vision restored, he still had trouble seeing. By the time we call him Paul, he continues to struggle with God being bigger than even he can imagine. He continues to work out his theology and tweak his dogma with fear and trembling. And as dogmatic and arrogant as the Apostle Paul was, <laughs> let's face it, most of us wouldn't like Paul. As dogmatic as the Apostle Paul was, he has at least begun to see enough to occasionally remember that the work of God in Christ Jesus is always beyond his understanding. We see through the glass darkly, Paul says. 
admitting that even he still cannot see clearly. With even him, things like culture and tradition and the way things have always been, the way I was taught, our prejudices, our reason, our ability to make sense of, and our ignorance, all of these things still muddy up our vision. And he keeps coming back for himself, and he keeps coming back to others, saying that the love and grace of Jesus is always, always, always above and beyond all that. My friend Brian grew up in a very conservative, evangelical Christian tradition, one that makes the conservative tradition many of us grew up in look liberal. He graduated from Moody Bible College. That tells some of you something. Being blind, Brian often experienced being seen by others as defective. There was something wrong with him. He needed to be fixed. Or perhaps there was something wrong with him because his parents or grandparents did something wrong and this was God's punishment on them to have a blind son. Worse, Brian says, was when well-meaning Christians would come up to him and tell him he was blind so that one day God could use him as a tool to miraculously heal him and prove God's power to everybody else. He said, I was a pawn. I was never more than an object for someone else's theology. Several times, from the time he was a kid, even into adult life, people walked up to him claiming to have been given the gift of healing and they were going to give him that sight that day. It never worked. Brian, again, was seen as a pawn, an object for others' religious faith. He said, he has told me how too many Christians still today only see them as something that could be used to make them feel better about their faith. People just couldn't see Brian. A child of God who just didn't have vision. A child of God loved by God, created by God, gifted by God in so many ways, carrying the likeness of God within him, worthy in friendship and love, simply because he is Brian, just as he is. Some of us know firsthand the, be, the, the power and the experience of being seen as imperfect, being seen as defective, something is wrong with you, being seen as an object that can be used for someone else's theological satisfaction. Some of us know firsthand the real terror like that small group of Jesus people among the first century Jews who experienced being targets in the sights of fierce God worry, warriors. Warriors, not warriors, sorry. And most of us who don't know those feelings know exactly what it's like to live life, life like Saul slash Paul. Always struggling to see more clearly, but always still with such an imperfect and muddled vision of what God is doing in people and the world around us. So much so that we still find it difficult to notice the presence of God in all things all around us and in all people all around us. Many of us can see physically, but we still struggle to truly see. May the prayer of the great hippie musical Godspell be our prayer this week. Day by day. Day by day. Oh dear Lord, three things I pray to see Thee more clearly to love Thee more dearly, and to follow Thee more nearly. And may I add that we see, love, and follow more dearly and nearly and clearly 
when we find thee in others. Day by day. May it be so. worshiped with us this morning from University Baptist Church. 
If you'd like to know more about us, visit our website, www.ubcstartville.org. You can reach out to our pastor, Bert, or to me, Sarah Harrington Jones. If this day, Mother's Day, has been difficult for you, we are praying that you will be exceedingly gentle with yourself. Know that you are seen. And if this day presents challenges because of the dissonance in the world, we hold space with you here at University Baptist Church. As you go from this place seeking justice and peace, may you find joy in the brightness of the day. May you find the calm of the smooth river and the stillness of a stone. Know that you go with the blessings of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit upon you in all the ways that you mother the world, that you are mothered by others, and that God is mothering you in each moment. Amen.